I think that we would all agree that worship is a vitally important aspect, a vitally important role of a believer. We are going to, after all, spend eternity in worship of our Lord. Now, we're not sure what that looks like. We can't imagine that. We can't fathom that because we don't spend a lot of time constantly worshiping anything with the exception of ourselves. But I want to get to the point and I want to deal with what the word worship actually is so that we can know what worship is. And you're going to find out that there are similarities in the three words. And there's a reason why these different words are used in the Bible to kind of convey what worship is. And so I want to go back to the very beginning. I want to start in Exodus. We see this also in Genesis, but I want to go to Exodus 20. God has given his commands and he says in Exodus 20 and 4, he says, you should not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth or beneath or in the water underneath. You shall not worship them or serve them for I am I your Lord am uh, I am your Lord God and a jealous God. In other words, who should you worship? You should worship only God. Now, the word that's used here, this is the Hebrew word kawa, which means to bow. It actually comes from, from the meaning to to kiss, but it means to bow down, to kind of prostrate yourself, to look down. Now think about this for a second. Many of you have pets or you have young children. Maybe you can remember when you were uh, a small child, or if you've ever looked at and stood in front of someone that's pretty big and you have to look up, it's a humbling thing sometimes to kind of look up or to imagine not looking down at someone, but looking up at someone. That's a humbling feeling. Think about a little puppy or a child or you yourself at times. Looking up, that's kind of the point. So when you are bowed down, the only way that you can look is to kind of look up. So there's a humbling um, uh, feeling when you are in true worship. So the question's got to be, then what is worship? Can you worship with your hands up? Well, sure. Sure, you are just simply surrendering in adoration of the one. There has to be an object of worship. And in this case, in our case, the object of worship is God. But I want to give more to it. It's not just that with kind of a reverential heart. By the way, it is impossible to reverence God unless you are reverential. It's impossible to uh, honor or to treat God or to uh, worship God unless you treat him or regard him as holy. You have to think of him in that regard. It's just impossible. Unfortunately, today we've got people who some sort of way want to bring God down, either down to their level or bring themselves up to God's level, basically so that they can look eye to eye with God. God is not our equal. And that's the whole point. When you recognize who he is, there should be something. That is, if you've got some sense, there should be something that would cause you to be humble for him and to bow down. This is God. This is not the president. This is not your boss, not your parents. This is God. So that word that's used there is the word hua. Now, there's another word that's also used in the Old Testament that we will also sometimes translate as worship. In Deuteronomy 6.13, he says, you shall fear only the Lord your God and you shall worship him and swear by his name. Now, what's interesting about this particular word, this is the Hebrew word, abed. Now, we use this word in different ways to, to connote work or service. Uh, this is a servant. And so why is this word used? And so if you just kind of use just the strict construction of the word, uh, you shall serve him and swear by his name. But why is the word worship there? Well, there is a reason why the word worship is used there because it's trying to convey something. I'll tell you that in a minute, but I also want to go to the next word. We don't see it a lot. As a matter of fact, we really don't see this word in Daniel, but this is the word in Daniel 3, 5. This is the word Sagat. Now this word means just simply, it, it means the same thing, which is to, uh, to worship. Doesn't really give a true um, conveyance as to what it means, but it just means just to just to worship. This is when Daniel, uh, they were told to bow down and worship before this image and they would not do so. But there's a reason why I want to cover this. Now I want to go back to the Old Testament and I want to go or say in the Old Testament, go to Exodus three. And I want to bring this home. So I want you to see what it means to truly worship. And I think too often we forget this. I think if we got this, I think we would be better as a body, better as individual Christians. In Exodus three twelve. This is Moses speaking to God. OK, now, so you understand the picture of what's happening. He's confronted with God who is in the in this burning bush. And in verse 12, he says, uh, and he said, certainly I will be with you 
and this shall be a sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship uh, God at this mountain. Okay, now who is telling him? Well, you may see a little bit these these circled words. This is Yahweh. This is the one who says, I am who I am. That's important. So you're going to worship him, worship him as God. Remember that because who are we going to worship? He says, I am that I am. Or the word is simply put, ek yesh, ek yesh, which is I am who I am. That is from God's standpoint or Yahweh. Same thing. I am. That's important. But notice what he says in verse 12. Let's go back to it in verse 12. He says, and you shall worship God at this mountain or on this mountain. Why is that important? Well, do you all recall a conversation that Jesus had about where and how the right way to worship in John 4? Jesus is speaking to the woman of the well. Look what he says. He says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that it is in Jerusalem. I'm sorry, the woman is saying this to Jesus. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, the word, the word that's used there for worship is the word proskuneo. We'll come to that word in just a second because there's also another word that's used for worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, you worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know or what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but an hour is coming. Look what he says. And now he is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worship first. Now, so the question is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, let's continue. By the way, the Bible says in verse 24, this is important as well. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Huh. That sounds fanciful. That sounds nice. But what does that really mean? Well, remember, he's re referring back to that mountain. That conversation was brought up. This is in from Exodus three. And what I want to do is I want to go back. I want to just type in the word worship and I want you to see the different words that are used. But this time, instead of looking at the Hebrew word, I want you to see the Greek word, the word from the Septuagint. Here's the reason why. Remember, the overwhelming majority of references in the Old Testament, I mean, in the New Testament about the Old Testament are from the Greek New uh, Septuagint. Jesus quotes most often from the Septuagint. So do the apostles. Why that's important is not so much about the Septuagint, but I want you to see the word that they use. And so let's go back to it. Here we have in, if I can find it, uh, the first time we see this in Genesis 22, 5, the word that's used for worship is the word proskenuo, which is important. That's fine. I want to drop down some more. And now this word that's used here in Gen Exodus 3, go back to Exodus 3 over here. Exodus 3, uh, here it is. Exodus 3, the word that's used on this mountain, they that worship him, uh, is the word abed. That's important. Why? Because in John 4, the word that's used in John 4 for worship is proskuneo. However, the Greek New Testament, I mean, the Greek Septuagint, the word is not proskuneo, which they could have used that word. The Greek word that's used there is letreu, which is to serve. I want you to think about that for a second. If the if the Septuagint is telling us that this word, uh, I, even the Hebrew word, is to serve in the Greek uh, Septuagint as well as the Hebrew text, it means to serve. But then Jesus uses the same word referring back to it means to to bow down, to kiss, to be holy, to be prostrate for. Now there's something that needs to kind of, huh, wait a minute. This might not make any sense, but it should. Hopefully, synapses will begin to fire and some connections might, connections might, be, uh, might begin to be made. The reason why this is important is because worship is necessarily tied to, one, how we see God. That's why we talk about who it is that's worshiping. Let's go back to John 4. When Jesus is talking to the woman, what does he say to the woman? He says uh, to the woman, uh, I know that no, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. He who was called Christ. She doesn't know how close she is, does she? When th when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus makes a statement. He said to her, I am he who speaks to you. I'm sorry. I who speak to you am he. Now, the word that's used here for I am he is the Greek word ego eme. 
Well, what do we know about that word? Well, Jesus has used this word to signify who he is being God in John 8, 24. Unless you believe that ego eme, that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 58, uh, before Abraham was, ego eme, I am. And so Jesus is making clear that he's the I am. Now he's speaking to her about what the I am said in Exodus 3, who also called himself I am about worshiping on that mountain. Which mountain? Well, it's not all that important because what God is looking for are the true worshipers, those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth indicating that how you do so, also understanding who you do it to. Remember, there has to be an object of worship. So God, the Lord God, who is Jesus, who Jesus is, is the object of this worship. But remember, God himself says that no other person can receive worship, but but we see God receive worship, but we also see Jesus. So Jesus making a, a statement about his deity, but also about what worship is. So worship necessarily has to entail how you look at him, how you treat him, and then how you serve him. So the word that's used in the Septuagint and the Hebrew text uh, means to serve, but this word means to be what? To be bowed down in a prostrated fashion, not necessarily walking that way, but that's how you approach him. Paul makes a statement in Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Some might just say, your, which is your reasonable sacrifice or your spiritual worship. The same word that's used there is the word for service, which is the Greek, the Greek word you see it highlighted is letruo. And so what are we supposed to do in our worship? It's used to serve him. That's why we serve him. That's our motivation for serving him. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's what we are about. We are about serving the Lord. Amen. And when you just run through the text, you keep seeing that it's used kind of interchangeably throughout the text for meaning to serve or to work or to be bowed down. It's the whole, that's the whole point. The whole point is to get uh, or to convey to us that as believers, because of how we see him, because of how we relate ourselves to him, we are in this humble fashion, this bowed, this prostrated fashion where we look up to him in humble fashion. If, if we are even able to look upon him and then what do we do as a result of that? We serve. Well, how do we serve? We serve others for the benefit of him. We serve him. How does he want us to serve him? by serving others, by loving others, by sharing the goodness of what he's done, rec helping, helping to reconcile others to him or being used to reconcile others to him. And this is where we don't get attitudes. This is where we don't get bent out of shape. Why? Because we're humble. We're bowed down. A bowed down servant is not worried about if he's being treated right or wrong. He knows that whatever he gets, he deserves and anything good that he gets, he's grateful for it. Why? Because he worships the Lord. And so that's the whole point. We'll serve him with honor. We'll serve him because it's our pleasure. And then we'll serve him because he's God. So in that way, we'll, we'll worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen.